I mean, I had, once I had the following experience, it's all anecdotal, you see. I was in a dry wash in the Negev desert, uh, and there was absolutely no food, and I was a poor traveling hippie, a hashashin, and a cave dweller, and a ne'er-do-well, and it was like 120 degrees outside my cave, and I was sitting in front of my cave, um, smoking hash, and out through the shimmering heat, I could see this dot of a person. And as I watched them making their way through the rocks and the scrub, uh, I began to have a fantasy about this person, that they had food, that they didn't simply have food, that, that they had oysters Rockefeller packed in ice, that they had Russian caviar, that they had Belgian chocolate, that they had all of this stuff. And, you know, I hadn't had a bath in three weeks. There was barely any water in this place. And this speck made its way toward me, getting larger and larger. And finally, it turned into this guy I barely knew, a fellow lost soul. This was in southern Israel 25 years ago. And he said, and he came up to me and he said, I have oysters packed in ice. I have Belgian chocolate. I have, and he had uh, gotten a job dishwashing that morning at the King David Hotel and had just quit in disgust halfway through the day and had raided this super fancy four-star hotel and just had a backpack full of this stuff. And I didn't even bother to tell him. I mean, what am I going to say, you know? I mean, sure, of course. <laughs> so these kinds of things, uh, and they're very private, you see. Nothing happens there except that a guy quits his job and rips off a uh, hotel, except that it is coincident with an internal state, a private musing of somebody else. And when the two things come together, the coincidence of it is absolutely excruciating. Uh, some way of unbridling the horse we ride so that it can take us where it wants to go, which is back into this place where ego isn't grabbing. Because you see, it must be so that if the magic retreats from each one of us in the wilderness, how much more then it must retreat from us as a community, en masse, as a planetary species. So, we live in a domain of triviality that we have created. You know, we have trivialized the world. The elves, the fairies, the water sprites, uh, the energies that flow in the earth with the seasons, the movement of the stars, the machinery of being, the, the drama of life and death. We push all this away and we hold ourselves above it I mean, death is sanitized, birth is sanitized, everything is made less authentic, as though we are somehow threatened by the authenticity of being. Why are we threatened by the authenticity of being? Uh, why does it take such tremendously powerful hallucinogenic agents to put us where we should be operating? in terms of our pattern of caring for the world and for each other. And this is a real question, I think. Uh, it, it goes hand in hand with the question that I think is very worthwhile for the group to try and deal with, which is, if psychedelics are so wonderful, are we better people? And if they 
are wonderful and we're not better people, then why not? What, is, what precisely is our relationship to people who know nothing of this? Uh, is this a way? Is it the way? Is it no way at all? How, how does the mystical vision feed back into how we are with and for each other? Are we doing enough with that? Are we, uh, you know, do we exemplify enough what we know and what we feel? And if we don't, how can we? Because this is our faith, I believe, that we have something precious that we want to give to those who are operating without awareness of it. that inch by inch by inch, the dream is actually gaining ground. There will be a second hearing. There will be an appeal from the absolute judgments of 20 years ago. Well, then in that case, it devolves upon all of us to embody this thing and to not cut corners and to, to you know, as it says in the Grateful Dead song, try just a little bit harder, just a little bit more. And I think doing that, and a lot of it is a letting go, it's not a pushing into, it's a letting go, then the magic draws close. I mean, uh, nature loves courage. You've heard me say this. The way nature loves shows her love of courage is by removing obstacles. That's how the shaman can dance in the waterfall. He can't dance in the waterfall, except that he's so damn courageous that God suspends the laws of physics in the face of such faith. You know, it's something like that. It's the courage to be, the courage to be. To be is to dance in the waterfall. I mean, I skim the ideas off the depth of a sea of heart whose boundaries cannot be taken, because that's my style. But the unsaid part, the dizziness of the things unsaid, remember the poem by Trumbull Stickney, I lean over your meaning's edge and I feel the dizziness of the things you have not said. And the dizziness of the things unsaid for us fans of dizziness is ecstasy, the vertigo. Weren't we first spun in the schoolyard? Wasn't that your first altered state of consciousness? to be spun and spun until you fall down and watch the world move around. It's the dizziness.